Today's gonna be a fun day. It's a lot of really good panels today with some people that I've you know looked up to for quite a while. So I'm gonna get footage of all that stuff. And you know, once again, I'm super excited and stoked just to have this opportunity. Wish me luck. Hey guys, it's Eric Norton here with Beckett Lab Presents, sponsored by Beyond Protocol this week, and I have a fresh face in the hobby for you, Mr. Josh Little. What's up, man? How are you? I'm amazing. How are you? You're a fresh face. I, I'm going to shake your hand, you? say thanks for being here, man. So, uh, what's new? None. <laughs> Nothing at all. I moved to Texas. <laughs> yeah, you moved to Texas? I, I, moved to, I moved to Austin. I've been there about a month. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, that's it. That's right. I, obviously, uh, there's some things that we we're not going to discuss today, just out of just out of respect for every, the whole situation. But I do want to get your thoughts on the hobby on a whole. We just sat down, we heard you guys in a great panel. But tell me about like your time after after leaving StockX to what we're seeing happening now in the hobby. Like, there's been just huge yeah. earthquakes almost. Like, what, what do you think is happening, really? What's interesting. Um, so there's a lot of people and there's a lot of articles and there's been a lot of um, uh, people that point to COVID and the pandemic as the reason for the growth of the hobby. Hobby was going to blow up in 2020 anyway. Like okay. we we're on that trajectory. I mean, I'm, you know, when we sat down at the National in 2019, mm -hmm. like you could feel it in the water at that time. You could feel the growth. You could feel the, the change sort of coming. And I think COVID and pandemic helped um, and kind of like put it on, on uh, you know, kind of steroids and, and push it that way. But man, we were going that way anyway because it's about our generation. It's about all of us coming back into the hobby of being that age where we have money, we have disposable income. And man, like now we're at the point where it, it starts with the people. It starts with, with the people that, that like the super fans that care about it and come in. And guess what? Really quickly after that, companies, startups, money, like all the infrastructure starts to come in. Mm -hmm. and, one of the questions that uh, is get asked more than any probably other question is like, well, what inning are we in, right? You're like you've heard that for like yeah. for years, right? And like for years, people have said, oh, we're in the, the second inning, we're in the, but prices have way outpaced the rest of the industry, and maybe prices are now in the sixth inning or seventh inning, but the infrastructure of the industry, infrastructure of the industry is still in like the second inning. Like mm -hmm. we have a long way to go in terms of, and that's a good thing. There's so much growth because of that. So. Speaking of those prices, might may, maybe being in the sixth or seventh inning, does that have to come back down to earth a little bit? I mean, and no, I, like what did? Right? Yeah, so it we, did. we hit the, this, these fever, this fever pitch around like you know January, February, and mm -hmm. that that stuff did come back down to reality. Which is really interesting when you think of like it, what is a, a grounded, reasonable number for that? Because let's take like the LeBron Topps Chrome ten, right? Sure. Two thousand three Topps Chrome ten. The card was almost a fifty grand, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's back down to, I don't know, 15, 16, you know, thousand. There's 2,000 of that card that exists. In the hobby, that's a relatively high pop number, right? Sure. You know, people are spending millions of dollars on stuff that's, you know, pop one, pop two, pop three. Fine. Oh, 2,000? Like, how many LeBron fans are there? Millions. Right. So, like, 2,000 compared to the, the total adjustable market for cards and total fan market. Like, what's the most populous card in the hobby? It's probably Luka 2018 Prism PSA 2. Yeah. We're probably closing it on 20,000, right? Mm -hmm. 20,000 is, like, how many people fit in the Maverick State? Sure. Like, it's like, so when you compare those numbers to, to the world and, and the growth, the potential growth of the industry, that, like, I actually think that where we're sitting on, the, that card, the LeBron card, will go way past 50,000 at some point in the sure. future. And it's just a question of that supply and demand of coming in equilibrium. So, yeah, like, we've, we've pulled back a little bit, and it'll I think it'll stay rational um, for the next foreseeable future. But I think long term, like... Long way to go. Long. Way to go. Well, what about wax then? Like unopened wax, because those, those well, prices are, are still high. That's a really good point, right? So I mean, you've seen you know prices come down considerably. You're what? You're a big hockey collector, yeah, yeah. right? So it did, did hockey cards go through the same issue like, like prison basketball did and that sort of stuff? Not, not to the extent that prison basketball did. Yeah. The, I mean, the fan base that collects hockey, Upper Deck did a really good job of keeping their prices reasonable. Yeah. You know, and you know, I, I, I've always just personally thought that the rookie classes from 18, 19, and 19, and 20 pushed the basketball prices to where they were. Uh, hockey, you didn't have that until like last couple of seasons. There were some big name rookies that you had to look out for. 
but it was never going to be on the level of Zion or Luca or Trey or anybody like that. So that's a good point, right? When you look at that, that total uh, sort of powder keg, you had like Luca at the center of it, right? It's not like you had, you know, this year where it was like Lamelo and Anthony Edwards. So yeah, I, I, I can see some of that as well. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, wax, wax prices, you know, that that's a much different uh, question, and I think it, you look at it a much different way. Um, but to your point, I think we can't help but be um, somewhat of a prisoner to the rookies, right? And right. That, that's just that's how it's always been. That's how it always will be. Um, you know, other than that, you know, I, I don't know if we have something that, that changes drastically, but. I don't know, man. We'll see with Trevor Lawrence. Like, yeah. you know, like, yeah. what is football prison going to look like with Trevor Lawrence? And what is football MT going to look like? I don't know, man. That what, could be scary. What do you say to the people who, like, rush to buy rookies out of current product and they don't wait, you know, the, the two, three, four months for those? Those prices are going to drop. I mean, why, why are people buying so high when they could just be patient? The flip side of that, right, is that if you happen to, to get that, that you know, hit the home run, right, and get sure. the rookie and, and stuff like that, Man, you, like, how many times have you gone back and looked and be like, oh, crap, you know, I could have bought Otani, you yeah. know, rookies for, you know, for for a hundred bucks or two, you know, and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a it's a tough place. I love, um, like, I, I'm I'm a shopper at the heart. Like, I'm a collector more than anything. Being at the National, by the way, this past year, mm -hmm. before any other news came out, before I would, it was great. I didn't, have, I had no responsibilities. I just shopped. I was just, it was nice. awesome to just go there and, and shop, and. I don't buy baseball prospects. Um, like I, I spend a lot of money on a lot of different cards, but I don't really buy baseball prospects for the point you're making mm -hmm. because I don't want to wait years to make sure. that. I'm okay waiting a couple months, like you mm -hmm. said, to find out you know where are we in terms of like am I you know am I in the black, am I in the red, what that's going to look like. But like more power to the baseball prospect for sure than years. Yeah. Is it like that in hockey? No, not really. Yeah. Uh, you know because in hockey. You see them coming up through you know, like the QHL or or the AHL or whatever, yeah. and Upper Deck has those brands, and so they produce cards for those, and so you can get on it on the ground level of those, knowing who's going to be hot as a young gun, because in hockey it all comes down to the young gun and, and the cup rookie. So uh, you can see that coming, and you can get it on the ground floor and not have to worry about if they're going to be a bust or not. Yeah, it, it's kind of kind of great. I want to ask you a couple more questions before we get you out of here. Sure. Uh, I know that you are a, a buyer and a collector of all things. You kind of watch all markets. I'm very bullish right now on the video, the graded video game market. Yeah. It's really nuts. Have, have you have you studied that at all and seen anything that you might like to share? Yeah. So I have a good friend who I'll leave his name out of this, who has been on video games for two years and has been, and I was so, I knew he was right. Mm -hmm. like, I knew he was right. And there was something that was so appealing about like, man, owning a Tyson punch out or owning a Zelda or owning like Rad Race or these games that were so important to me growing right, up. Yeah. And um, and even though I didn't take that step, I've, I've now bought a total of three games. I own one Tyson, one Zelda, and one Rad Racer because those three were just important to me personally. Sure. Um, but I spend so much money on cards and, and, and sneakers and toys and other stuff. I'm not taking the plunge just purely from a some sort of financial <laughs> restraint. However, I absolutely believe in that market, and I think it is because it is it hits at the core of for all of us having grown up in that stuff is important. And I think more so than, than cards, you put a, a water uh, you know um, slab on your desk, and it's got a Zelda, you know, Legend of Zelda in it. And that looks fucking cool. Yeah, it sure right? does. And yeah. like, and I and you know, cards are very hard to display, even if you have a display system that's so small. But to have like, I have on my desk, I have my three games. That are, that are on this. I think that's really cool. So yeah, so I, I'm bullish on the market as a whole, notwithstanding the fact that I'm not, you know, I've chosen not to engage as a, as a collector. I, I have also seen, and just a kind of a weird ancillary thing, sealed VHS is like kind of making a comeback too. I saw that. Too. And I don't, I don't quite understand that. Who even owns a VCR anymore to even want to well, eat? Well, I, guess, I guess that's why we let's grade them up. It's not like you can use them. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, the whole thing. Exactly. I, I, that, I saw that as well. I haven't bought any, although I will tell you, I was like, hmm, but I want to have a white men can't jump. Oh, yeah. Jazz. I think that would be cool. You know, like, there's so, like movies, same thing. Like, movies are, are really important uh, to a lot of people. So I think it's interesting. I don't know. I, I don't think it's going to have the same, I don't think it's going to have the same trajectory as, as video games. But, right. But we'll see. I think where it could, and maybe not as hot, but 
those sealed Disney eggshell videos. So like Lion King, Pinocchio, Cinderella, yeah. that kind of stuff. Because I mean, there's that Disney market that's crazy anyways. And, that's a good point. and seeing it. So what's, see, what's the one movie you'd want to have from a, how on your desk? What's your like one movie? Oh, it, I think you named it already. It's White Man Can't Jump. I know, like, that's a good one. Uh, that's, uh, I, I was thinking about that. I don't know if they made a VHS of, uh, of The Matrix when it came out in 99 or we were already done with the with DVD. VHS. It's probably a DVD yeah. of that. You saw the new Matrix preview? I saw it. It looks awesome. Oh, it looks Are you I'm excited like, for it? Yeah, I'm like beyond excited. <laughs> so like, I'm just old enough where 99, I was a senior in college. Like That was like the biggest thing of like everybody in school was like, you know, in college you don't spend a lot of time going to movies. Right. And I, and I was like, yeah, it was such a big deal. So, Do you have a favorite um, one? One, two, or three? Well, it's one. It's I mean, one, yeah, obviously, it's right? Obviously, it's obviously one, but I got to tell you, man, the new one looks pretty good. It looks really good. I'm excited to see that. Um, now. I'm going to get back to why I make that jump because that was going to be my final question for you uh, in transition into your Jimi Hendrix collection. Do you, first yeah. of all, do you hear Jimi? Or... <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So, but hey, tell me about yeah. that. Tell me about your Jimi Hendrix collection. Yeah. So, um, there were a, a handful of card sets that were made in the 60s and 70s, mainly by uh, Swedish candy companies that, that ended up making it. And I assume they were unlicensed mm -hmm. you know, in, in, at the time. But... In 68 and 69, there was, there's probably about uh, four different Hendrix cards each year. 68 being his earliest known cards would be like, considered kind of his working card. Sure. And um, like anything else, like I found one, and then I found another, and then I started really digging. And what happened was, I uh, like a lot of things, I bought a high-end Hendrix because they're, they're, the pop reports on this are all super low. Sure. Even, you know, even the, the ones that have the most, you're probably only talking a total pop report of maybe like 20 or 30 with, you know, no PSA 10s, like, like one or two nines. Like it's super, like because it's the 60s, because most of them are smaller cards. So I bought like a high-end Hendrix from a guy on eBay and he made some sort of comment afterwards in the, in the email that like I have others if you're interested. And I was like, oh, I was like, not knowing. I was like, yeah, I'll buy them all. And then he emails me back off of eBay. He's like, it's a lot. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, and so let's figure it out. And so um, I've been buying a lot of my own, but then this one deal, I mean, wasn't six figures, but it was pretty damn close wow. of a lot of Hendrix cards, all graded, all like really high end and stuff. And uh, I'm not selling any of that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's all it's all going away for a long time. So that's been, but there's, there's basically five other kind of like rookies in that same era that I think are important. So Led Zeppelin, Bob Dylan, um, Clint Eastwood, uh, which obviously is not um, uh, not music, but also uh, mm -hmm. and uh, there's one. Oh, and there's a, there's an Eric Clapton rookie like in that same genre. And then there's this card that I uh, I'm, I think I have the most of. I think I've put in the market. It's a Beatles um, Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali card. Yeah, yeah. Right, and that that card as well, which I think is the earliest. I, it's like the only part of, the, of that that of Peter Muhammad. So, anyway, I think all that stuff, like all those people, are as iconic as any athlete ever. And I think there's just the market will come around. But I gotta tell you, that's one of those ones. Even they don't, I don't care. I think it's so cool that I have all these like, Jimi Hendrix rookies. Sure. And the picture's so badass because Hendrix was just such a you know right. such an a, a amazing you know person and dresser and everything else. And then what about Bruce Lee? Because he falls right there as well, you know and. There was a run probably in the last four months, four or five months on his cards as well. I bought the Green Hornet. I bought a month. couple of the Green Hornet ones, um, and then there's this set uh, that he's in with Chuck Norris. Yeah, yeah. Right, and I forget the name. It's of the Inner the Dragon. Is it? Is yeah. that Inner Dragon with Norris? It's, I believe it's. If I'm okay. wrong, you guys will correct yeah, yeah. me out there, but I think it's Inner the Dragon. So yeah, so um, I didn't go nearly as deep on that, but I figured that like to own a couple of Bruce Lee rookies, like you can't go wrong with that. Like again, you know, as iconic right. of, a, of a of a figure as, as anyone in the world, and. The Green Hornet ones are kind of neat, right? Because they're him as Kato, and, yeah. and so you have this. Absolutely. There's, there's a, I think that the hobby has not really narrowed in. There's like three or four that I think everyone kind of likes. And I'm yeah. like, so hopefully the one of the ones I have gets narrowed in. Is one of those? Yeah. All right, let me ask you one yeah. last true question before we get out of here. I know that you're, you're, you're off you're on a stock, stock guys, but you still pay attention to that market. What's, what's, uh, what's going to be the next hot shoe, do you think? I think we're still in the Travis generation okay. where like everything he puts out is just at, at another level and he's put out a bunch um, obviously this last uh, you know collaboration with Fragment um, it's just a big deal all the collaborations with Fragment he's done with Jordan have been big deals um, but I don't think we're like at a saturation point it's not like with Yeezy where like that's become more of a mass market you know shoe I think you know 
we're still we're still kind of in the in the travel zone for, for shoes. So we'll, I'm interested to see what, what else he puts out there. That's gonna be awesome. All right, guys, that's gonna be it. Again, thanks for bringing on protocol. Thanks, Josh, for your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, we're gonna be back a little bit later.